Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar delivered by CSRA. Today, we'll find out more about environmental and social responsibility in the supply chain, which is exci an exciting topic. Before I hand over to our presenter, however, I just wanted to remind everyone that this session is being recorded and will be sent online to all of our attendees later today. The webinar will include an approximately 45 minute presentation followed by a Q&A session at the end. Please use the chat function to submit all of your questions and we'll make sure that those get answered. I also want to thank our uh, Hexagon, who are the sponsor of today's webinar. They are a global leader in digital reality solutions and make manufacturing smarter. So to find out more about what they do, you can visit their website, hexagonmi.com. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Richard, who will lead today's presentation. Over to you, Rich. Thank you, Lena. Thank you very much for that introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Richard Collins and I'm the co-founder and uh, SEO and CEO of um, CSRA accreditation, um, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. But today um, I'm going to talk about uh, environmental and social responsibility in the supply chain. And, and I really want to kind of you know, emphasize that this is now um, not a kind of nice thing to do. It's it's now in, in many ways becoming a kind of mandatory requirement to engage up and down the supply chain around what your organization is doing with regards to its own environmental and social responsibility, but also in terms of things like um, the race to net zero and um, the scope um, three requirements as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through my slides and then take you on um, a little bit of a journey. We are the only organisation in the UK um, delivering a global accreditation for social responsibility. And what that means is that we provide an independent um, recognition and validation of an organization's um, environmental and social responsibility activities. So in many cases, organizations will have processes in place, um, but to avoid greenwashing, um, it becomes important for uh, almost a third party organization to kind of validate what that organization is doing. And I'm gonna touch a little bit on the green claims code as well that was introduced by the UK government this year. It's a powerful way um, to communicate um, positive actions to all stakeholders by being accredited. But we also have four main areas. One is um, our, our uh, communication, which is through social impact report writing. One is through consultation. Um, one is through the training, the education side of it, and also the accreditation. Um, and, and all of those things together um, help deliver the tools and uh, dialogue and narrative that organisations can use to address a whole range of issues that um, we're hearing more and more of every day. So people talking a lot about sustainability. Uh, we think of sustainability as being the sustainability of an organisation, not just the environmental sustainability. And people talk about the eat their ESG considerations. So we'll look at a little bit about the impact that ESG investing is having and the how the, the role of the ratings agencies. Um, and we're, we're also looking at the social value side of things, how this has an impact with regards to tendering um, and also building a culture that's a, a really great place for your people to work and building on your brand reputation. So that's kind of the space that we're in. Um, but it kind of goes back a little bit. Um, you know, environmental and social problems um, across the globe grow more serious each year and stakeholders are paying more and more attention to um, social responsibility activities. And an increasing number of businesses are taking into account the social and environmental impact of activities throughout the supply chain. And this comes from direct or indirect complaints received from stakeholders or mistakes seen at other companies. In recent years, there is a growing trend of companies conducting audits and or sending social responsibility surveys to their suppliers, setting up CSR procurement policies and showing preferential treatment to suppliers who cooperate with their CSR efforts. So, you know, you may be part of a supply chain that you've been part of for many, many, many years, but now there is a requirement to, to meet a certain set of standards required, re regarding what you're doing. And I think if you're not able to demonstrate that, then you know you may not remain in the supply chain. You, that, that you may be replaced by an organisation that is able to deliver those those um, important areas. But it's now more important than ever to show that we are doing everything we can to improve the world for future generations by reducing the negative impact that we have on the environment and building a better cohesive society for us to live and work in. So much as as you can appreciate, even today with the with the with the, with the budget. Um, news. So much has changed in the last three years, and this has had a profound impact 
on us as human beings. So it taps into us as individuals, as well as the way our organisations operate. We have seen the workplace reinvented at lightning speed and the employee experience has dramatically changed as we shift to hybrid working and a mixture of hybrid and office based working and the challenges that presents. We also have seen um, um, and become much more aware of environmental issues, especially with COP27 and the recent climate that we've seen in this country and around the world. Um, we have become much more aware of things like uh, the cost of living and the cost of fuel and how that's having an impact on our lives and a greater focus on improving diversity and inclusion within the office, a heightened awareness around mental health and well-being and the importance of building meaningful and authentic community engagement. And the reason I have the deep planet is because I think for us, a lot of this conversation started with plastics in the ocean, a debate that focused on a certain issue. And now those environmental and social issues like Me Too and Black Lives Matter, they, they, they have come into our homes, they've come into our, our spaces for discussion. So we, we think about them as human beings, but when we go to the office, they're things that we discuss and they're things that have an impact on the office as well. So, I think it's very important to effectively build uh, a responsibility policy. And, and, and this is now not a nice to have. It is very much an essential thing for organizations to have. And in many ways, from our point of view as an accreditation body, we have seen, for example, um, that organizations already have a lot of stuff in place, but that it's scattered and they can't quite see it. So it's a question of how we can pull that all together and create a policy or a strategy around it that we can then communicate both inwardly to our people, to our, to our employees, um, but across the supply chain and ultimately to our customers and to, and to consumers as well. And this is all about how we can mitigate risk. So if you develop a strategy um, that's aligned with your business vision and mission, you can then use that strategy to um, benefit your organization's risk management. So managing risk is a, is a proactive process to avoid issues that can damage your business. And the entire ESG uh, agenda, the Environment, Social and Governance agenda, is exactly that. It's about rating agencies looking at uh, an organisation um, to see whether they are a risk or they are an opportunity for investment markets to invest in. Um, and, and if a business can show that it's transitioning towards, for example, a low carbon future, then that will be seen as a positive opportunity for an investment market to invest in. But obviously it's looking for risks and those organisations that may have poor governance, may have poor social um, actions and, and, and may, be doing, may be working in a sector that has a negative impact on the environment and, and not necessarily showing that there's a transition out of that. So good risk management may involve, of course, spending a little money now to avoid paying a lot of money later, either in terms of fines, but also in terms of lost business. And some of the key reasons why people leave their jobs is because of a feeling of a lack of purpose within their organisation. So a lot of the conversations I've had recently, uh, and I'm not going to you know, bang on lots about ESG. ESG is a conversation that, can, that is there. It's, it's something that we have to, to think about and understand the language of it. But my, my belief is that you can't deliver the E without the S and the G. So in other words, if you're going to have a positive impact on the environment in terms of what your company's doing, um, you need to have your people involved and you need to have the good governance in place to make sure that happens. And, and that means building a culture within your organisation that creates the enablement to allow this sort of uh, initiatives to, to blossom. So for businesses, continuity purposes, you also need to ensure that your stakeholders are following your CSR principles. So in many ways, it's about sharing your best practice um, with your supply chain, with your customers and, and with your employees as well, so that everyone is involved in the, joint, in the journey and, and putting together to deliver uh, a, a positive impacts. And you are only as strong as your weakest supply chain link as well. So, you know, it may be that if you're the brand that's delivering the product and the services to customers and you're using organisations within your supply chain, and one of which may be behaving negatively, that they may not necessarily get picked out. It may be your organisation that suffers the consequences of that because, you know, the feeling is that you're not doing enough due diligence around uh, looking at your supply chain to make sure that there isn't, for example, a toxic 
culture of bullying in, in the workplace of that business or that business that you're working with is not um, polluting the local river or whatever it might be. So it's very important that, um, you know, you really uh, look at your supply chain to make sure that they are following your sense of values and principles as well. So what is what is driving this? Where, where has this all come from in terms of, um, you know, the the kind of the political drivers i suppose uh, and the uh, global drivers um that have started to impact us and, and i think what we've had for a long time with the big global pressure groups. So I'm going to touch on some of these and walk down a little bit to, to how these influ influence us. But obviously the UN was created at the end of the last of the Second World War to keep peace and security worldwide. And then following that, we had the World Economic Forum that meets every January in Davos, Switzerland, where we're getting world leaders, politicians and academia meeting to discuss global and economic and social systems and issues. And these often tear down into, into legislation or regulation at some point that we have to abide by. So, so part of what I want to encourage is organisations to, is to, is to kind of look at the, these things coming down the line and maybe putting stuff into place now within their supply chain um, while they have a choice to do it rather than having to do it. And then, of course, uh, the G7's just met. Um, that's the intergovernmental organisation made up of the world's largest developer economies, such as Germany, France, Italy and Japan. And the G20, which includes the G7, and, and, and looks at organisations like Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Chile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when we start to look at um, international um, export and import, we are going to be subject to the countries that we work with and the requirements that they have within their supply chain um, about the kind of businesses that they want to, to do business with. So this isn't just something that we have to think about within the UK. It is a global issue. And then we have the IPCC report. This is the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and it's a United Nations body made up of over 100 scientists for assessing the science related, related to climate change. Their sixth report produced in 2021 stated that it's unequivocal that human beings are responsible for global warming, that we are, you know, it may be that there's a natural baseline for climate change, but we are pushing this forward. The last part called mitigation of climate quotes the term code red, emphasizing the role of humans in addressing this crisis. The Paris Climate Change Conference in 2015 highlighted an increase of the glo average global temperature of beyond 1.5% will have a dramatic quant co uh, consequence on life supporting ecosystems. And we've already got to 1.8% um, um, in terms of the variation of, of change, which is beyond um, what has been um, recommended. During COP26 in November 21, countries have put forward pledges to reduce emissions that are insufficient to limit global warming. So the latest estimate post COP26 is about 1.8 um, degrees. Um, and if all, that's if all countries stick to their commitments. And, and I think we've seen in the news recently the significant difference the war in Ukraine has made on climate change just, just in what's happening in that one area. But the sad thing is the message hasn't changed um, much since the first IPC report in 1990. And we're now on report number six. So this is becoming more and more urgent. We've been talking about this for, for decades now, but we are beginning to see the effects. And this is going to have an impact on our businesses and how our businesses operate. So the emphasis is put on regenerative impact as opposed to us just being neutral. We need to fix what is broken and we need to do that collaboratively. And then we have the Conference of the Parties, the COPs, um, that have been running for 30 years. The thing is, up until 1922, and there have been 25 previous COPs, um, scientists more or less saying the same thing, that human activities are causing global warming. But it wasn't until the Paris Conference that attendees to the COP were made up, which traditionally were made up of members of governments and scientists. But in 2015, businesses were invited to join. And this is a big sea change. So businesses and certainly big corporates have an impact and the way that trickles down to the SME to, to markets also, because if you think about where employees exist, 90% of the world's employees sit within the SME markets, but those are driven by the big organisations, the big corporates as well. So big organisations are invited to join the discussion, recognising the impact of the private sector on climate change. And it's how we mobilize the SME organizations to get behind um, 
you know, the impacts that we're making and, and to make a real big difference. At COP26, which took place in Glasgow in November 2021, had four main goals. One was to secure global net zero by 2050 and keep the increase of the average global temperature below 1.5 degrees. Keep 1.5 alive was the phrase. And, and that's something that we're not sure we can do. The second was to adapt to protect communities and natural habitats. The third was to mobilise finance to deliver on those first two goals. And the fourth was to work together to deliver the above. Now, I, I was at a climate change conference um, uh, a couple of months ago, and it was looking at the investment markets. And interestingly, it said that the net zero asset managers are sitting on $67 trillion worth of investment that they don't know where to put it because they don't know what industry sectors they should be putting their money into. And this comes back to organisations being able to demonstrate that they are working towards net zero or working in collaboration with their supply chains to, to reduce the impacts they have on the planet. So that's a significant amount of investment that's sitting around waiting to be used um, to, to change um, the world for the better. So the current commitments to curb um, greenhouse gases um, are put on a trajectory towards 2.1 to 2.4 degrees of temperature increase, which will cause more extreme weather events, flooding, droughts, destruction of ecosystems and climate refugees. And we also saw in the news this morning considerable flooding as a result of the, of the rains in the south of England just, just recently. And this is where we start to hit um, some of the mandatory requirements. And, I, and I'm sort of taking us on a journey here because I really think it's important to kind of look at uh, those global pressures and that kind of regulatory framework that's coming down to 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 to, to, to us and and how we need to act within um within the the, the supply chains that we operate so the tcfd um the task force on climate related financial disclosure was created in 2015 by the financial stability board the fsb it is designed to create consistent climate related financial risk disclosures for use by companies, banks and investors in providing information to stakeholders. The UK government has made the process of making TCFD mandatory. So in general, this will apply to all UK companies with over 500 employees or a turnover of over 500 million. And this will this is expected to come down to the SME levels as well. So this isn't just going to sit at organisations that are operating at those levels. They are expected, and this is since the 1st of January 2021, to report their climate impacts to authorities the same way they disclose their financial results. So from 2023, financial institutions and listed companies must publish transition plans that contribute to the government's net zero commitment or to provide an explanation if they have not done so. Um, and, and that will have an impact on whether those organisations will be um, used, certainly within uh, a governmental framework. And the, 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 the kind of visible result of that, and I, I think if you if you look at um, Buckinghamshire and, and the work that BBF are doing with regards to net zero, it's, it's about how do we achieve net zero and why is net zero so, so important? It's important um, as it's the best way we can tackle climate change by reducing global warming. What we need to do in the next decade to limit emissions will be critical to the future, which is why every country, every sector, every industry, and each one of us must work together to find ways to cut the carbon we produce. And therein lies something that we have to think about with regards to the way that we look at our commitments um, up and down the supply chain. So you may have heard around uh, the, the, the organisational carbon footprint outside of our direct control, scope one and scope two and scope three. So scope one shows that direct emissions from owned or controlled sources. So that's quite easy. Um, we, can, we can report on what our business or, uh, is, or organisation is doing within our business. We can look at how we can turn the lights off or how we can um, travel to and from work and so on and so forth. Scope two is the indirect emissions from the generation of purchase electricity streams, heating or cooling. Um, uh, and then scope three is upstream is indirect emissions from purchase goods and materials or indirect emissions from use of products and services. And that accounts for 87% outside of its direct control. So if you're going to report on your scope three 
permissions, you'll need to be talking to organizations to, you know, behind or in front of you within the supply chain as to what they're doing. And that means if, for example, um, you're a, um, a, uh, I don't know, a, 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 an organization that's providing conference facilities um, and you have a, a, a catering department that you s outsource, then you'll be needing to talk to that catering department about the energy that they're using to provide the catering and the cost of travel uh, or the use of fuel to, to deliver that catering to your organization. And on the other end, if you've got conf um, companies using your conference facilities and um, companies coming in to use them for their conferences, you'll be asking them to, to, to look at the travel that they're going to have and bringing people to your conference center. But they're also going to be looking to you equally to look at the, the energy that's being used um, in the conference that you're providing, the facilities that you're providing for them. So everybody up and down the supply chain will be asked to look at what their energy performance is to provide that information um, up and down the supply chain to others so they can report it within their reporting. And this is where if we're going to have um, an accurate uh, commitment to 2050 and if the government is going to be able to say, look, we have achieved our net zero goals, hopefully before 2050, then we need to be able to show that we can deliver the evidence to support that we are reducing our carbon footprints. And the only way to do that is through measuring it and recording it and, and communicating it. And to do that, we need to engage with our supply chains to, to, to get that information together. So really it's about external stakeholder management. You know, what is your business doing to engage with your supply chain? It's all about collaboration. We cannot work in isolation or a silo. Your stakeholders or supply chain will have good ideas um, or of, of how you can operate and work with them, um, constricting conditions such as legislation and permits, etc. Share your CSR visions on objectives and targets so that you can mitigate risk and are all pulling in the same direction. Encourage collaboration. Co-lead innovation based on CSR principles. And I'm going to look at how we can develop a framework for those CSR principles that we can, we can use to put together strategies that help this collaboration work. So, can you name the external stakeholders in the, in the organizations that you work? How do you currently engage with your, your external stakeholders? And what are the different engagement methods or the routes for different external stakeholders? So it's really addressing, do we know who they are? Do we know where they are? How are we communicating them above and beyond normal business channels? So it is about engaging with um, that external supply chain, helping towards organizations actively managing their impact and doing good. So keep asking them what they want in terms of CSR, because this may not just be about ESG requirements. It may not just be about net zero, but it also may be about things like tendering as well. So uh, an organization that's putting a tender for private sector tendering or public sector tendering in which the tender is weighted up to 30 percent in terms of environmental and social responsibility. If you're using organizations to supply services and products to you to help deliver the work that you want to deliver for, for a local authority, then you're going to need to provide that information as well. So, you know, when you're talking to your supply chain, ask what they want or what you want um, to get that information. So engage up and down your value chain to gain competitive advantage. Tap into their expertise and, collabor and, 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 collab and collaboration as well. So you might find that there are organizations in the supply chain who are doing brilliant things already. And there's nothing wrong with saying, well, can we learn from you? How, how can we adapt what you're doing? How can we deliver what you're doing so that we can work alongside you? And if you are doing something brilliantly, then, you know, show the leadership, put together a steering group, work with your supply chain to communicate the things that you're doing well. Some organizations in your supply chain may be bigger than you and you can absolutely learn from them. And with regards to the way you communicate what you're doing, be transparent um, with all the good and the bad that happens to your organization. Because if there's something that you're doing wrong, not because you were doing it intentionally wrong, but something that you, know, you weren't aware of and someone pointed out, and you can then show how you're going to fix that problem, then that's a really important way of, 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 of working together to say, okay, we can, we can get things right. So sometimes, you know, reporting things that, 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 are, that are bad isn't necessarily a bad thing. It shows that we are recognizing things that we're not doing as well as we could be, and we're working towards how we can fix those problems. 
And the important thing is, is that investors' banks will look at these credentials and these ESG scoring. They, they, this will have an impact on how your organisations, supply chains that operate within your organisations are going to be viewed by the investment markets and by customers as well. So what is the supply chain? I think we probably all know, but for the benefit of the presentation, you know, supply chain CSR is when companies that make up a supply chain work together to share, understand and work to fix environmental and social problems. Generally, a supply chain is made up of multiple businesses involved in a process that extends from procurement and natural resources all the way to distribution. Therefore, in the event that one of those companies in the supply chain is criticised by stakeholders for its activities, damages may be borne not only by that one company, but the other companies within the same supply chain. So to reduce this risk, businesses generally exchange information by conducting surveys, etc., to better understand the status of both social responsibility activities that protect the business and the CSR activities that expand the business within the supply chain. This exchange of information is followed by on-site investigations and audits. So it's about building capacity and putting together processes and policies that you can use to deliver that information. If a problem is found with CSR activities which are designed to protect the company, the company should fix these issues to comply with laws that meet the stakeholder expectations. CSR that expands the company, on the other hand, can benefit the entire supply chain by increasing competitiveness and strengthening the chain itself. This means that the promotion of supply chain CSR not only increases competitiveness for services and products, but it also increases positive social and environmental impact. And this gives prospective business partners a reason to trust and choose a company within the supply chain. While CSR focuses on taking stakeholder needs into account to combine increased competitiveness with positive social and environmental impact, supply chain CSR is about applying this concept to not just a single company, but the entire supply chain. And there are some key priority areas to think about, and part of the framework that we've developed will help you pull those together so you can understand them and see them where they're relevant to your organisation. There are typically six priority areas in supply chain social responsibility. Information exchange regarding supply chain CSR can generally be broken down into these six areas. However, there are things that sit outside and I've included employee value and community engagement as well. To put it another way, these categories represent the areas where problems are likely to occur due to negative impact of business activities and which stakeholders must often focus on. So with regards to human rights and labour rights, um, it's preventing forced labour, preventing unpaid labour, preventing inhumane treatment, monitoring working hours. You know, you probably saw yesterday um, that Elon Musk uh, has now decided that he wants to use the, I think it's the, uh, is it the 6 6 Oh, I can't remember the name of the the, uh, the Chinese policy now, but I think it's six hours. A day. It's, it's, is it nine? No, twelve six six. I think it is. Um, but it's basically encouraging his workforce now to work. You know, twelve hours a day or nine hours a day, um, six days a week. Um, you know, for the same pay. Um, you know, because that's the work ethic he has, and it goes. It's completely contrary to the idea of you know the Europeans and the UK perhaps looking at four day weeks and reducing hours, but improving productivity. Um, preventing child labour. So, you know, if you're working within certain industry sectors, and we've, we've seen this with textiles, where child labour was found in some factories um, in, in the UK and Leicester specifically. So it's understanding how we can look at that. Respecting freedom of association and preventing employee discrimination. So really looking at <clears throat> good D&I programming and policy making as well. Safety in the workplace, of course. Um, safety measuring for operating equipment, emergency response, workplace safety measures, workplace sanitation methods, employee health management, safety and sanitation for employees' facilities, measurements to prevent work-related industries and health hazards. And then things like environmental production, reducing and preventing pollution, measures to reduce the emission of greyhound hazards, so that could be part of that transition measuring measures to protect biodiversity, and then renewable energy and resources. So again, transitioning to different ways to things like electric cars or hydrogen or, or different battery technologies. And then we have anti-corruption measures and fair trade, 
preventing bribery and corruption, preventing the abuse of a dominant bargaining position, preventing actions that restrict competition and preventing inappropriate, inappropriate payments and favours. And then quality and safety control for products and services. System for maintaining and increasing quality and safe control, providing accurate information on products and services. Disclosing, monitoring and protecting information, timely disclosure of the problems relating to the five categories listed. Defences against things like GDPR and computer viruses and hackers, preventing leaks of private information and preventing leaks of sensitive information on customers and third parties. And then when we start to look at employee value and community engagement, it's about how we look after our people, our workforce, how we provide a culture that people want to be part of. So, you know, part of that risk mitigation with regards to social responsibility and environmental um, initiatives is about retention. Um, you know, asked uh, today, uh, the SMEs, the two biggest concerns that they have is recruitment and net zero. So we have an issue with attracting talent. And we know, <clears throat> in fact, the statistic I heard a couple of months ago was that in the Commonwealth countries, 68% of the population are under the age of 30. And that's a generation that has a very different attitude about the kind of businesses that they want to work for and where they want to work. So, you know, it's it's about retention. It's about engagement. It's about uh, attracting talent into your business. It's about community engagement. So not being outside of the community, but working with the community. So supporting local economic growth, supporting local recruitment um, and supporting the, 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 the supply chain within a geographical area which is all, all very important. So what, what I want to do, and I kind of finish off this session with, is, is kind of look at a new standard um, in which we can use to build a strategy around environmental and social responsibility that we can deploy up and down the supply chain and use that to ask the questions and to create alignment. So what we have done, and we, 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 we were looking into many years ago, was <clears throat> first of all, challenging the definition of corporate social responsibility. So first of all, we wanted social responsibility to allow you to enrich the quality of lives um, for all by investing in social value as an essential part of an organization's culture. And this then provides that purpose and impact that will ensure a sustainable and profitable business. But it will also help to build a better world for future generations by improving the environment and ensuring a cohesive community to live and work in. So we wanted that definition for social responsibility. Secondly, we wanted to challenge the C in CSR so that the C doesn't only stand for corporate. It stands for company, for community, for charity. <clears throat> it also stands for consumers, citizens and collectiveness. So the idea of collaborative social responsibility. And finally, what we wanted to do was create the four pillars of environment, workplace, community and philanthropy. And within those four pillars, what we can start to see is we can start to see um, we, we can address the issues that we look at in those six areas of concern with regards to um, supply chain CSR. Uh, and we can list within each of those pillars what we're doing already. And by doing that, we can start to identify where the gaps are. So, for example, we have addressed under the environmental pillar an area for waste, supply chain management, energy, natural resources and travel, and then anything else that you may or may not be doing. And under uh, the workplace, we're looking at training, labour practices, ethical practice, governance and policies. And those policies will include a diversity inclusion policy or mental health and wellbeing policies. Under the community, we're looking at community engagement, local issues, wealth creation, projects and groups and education. So that so and you can see how the community and workplace pillars may overlap in terms of apprenticeships, um, skills training um, and and um, education. And then finally, philanthropy, um, supporting charities through things like volunteering, pro bono work, gifts in kind and so on and so forth. But these four pillars provide receptacles in which you can look at what your organisation is doing today. And list those things down so you can see them in the you know for the first time and then it's a question of how you align what those things are with organizations within your supply chain so this might then start a narrative or a conversation in which you can create surveys or questionnaires and match also up 
with what's required in things like tendering or for you know your your, your financial disclosures um, and it will also show where the gaps are so by doing this exercise by using these four pillars and basically you know thinking about what you're doing you'll also see where there are holes and and if you have those holes so a, a classic example around carbon footprinting we've had many companies who have um come through the accreditation process saying we've done x y and z to reduce our carbon footprint um, and pass that information on but they haven't had their carbon footprint to worked out in the first place so often where we start to see the gaps especially if you're going to start reporting your scope three and your net zero um, data is you need to get a baseline in the first place and if you haven't already got that then at least you can highlight that and then identify a third party organization that can help you then address what your carbon footprint is now so that you can measure and report um, the successes in the future and i believe um, in buckinghamshire with bucks business first that there's um some European funding that um, goes towards uh, uh, free carbon auditing um, for your organization. So um, I think you can find more information on their website about that. Certainly our organization went through that and it was very it was a very useful thing to do. And what what we've tried to do with CSR accreditation as an organization is is begin is be the center of a journey. So in other words, it's starting somewhere. We 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 feel that the start of a journey should not be complicated or difficult because I think it puts people off. People may not have the capacity or the money to invest in building this. So in other words, start something simple, start a process, start your journey. And then with that, you can look at how that can help to address sustainability issues, the environment, social and government issues, how it can even address and identify the sustainable development goals that you might want to align your business with. And again, if you're working within the supply chain, you may then collectively look at what those SDGs are and make a commitment to them as a supply chain. And that's also how we can then collaboratively work together to address climate change and the race to net zero and also develop a policy and works around social value, which has um, a lot of pertinence when it comes to public sector and private sector tendering. So it's about a holistic approach that addresses a, a complicated landscape that appears to be getting more and more complicated as more and more language is used. But really, it's very, very simple. It's just doing the right thing, and that will have a commercial benefit to your organization, as well as a positive benefit to the planet that we live and work on. And those four pillars can be aligned to other areas like the SDGs. So you can take those 17 SDGs and align them against those four pillars. And then with regards to the ESG, and again, ESG is a topic that's becoming louder and louder. People are very confused about it. We sit on the All Parties Parliamentary Group for ESG and work with the government around the language and the landscape for ESG. Um, we recently had a presentation by the FCA um, on um, regulatory framework um, that will be globally applied, um, but will only affect you know, the really top, the biggest companies. Um, so ESG at the moment is something that is exclusively um, for investment markets when it comes to making investment decisions on acquisition or funds um, around risk and opportunities um, and, and, and supporting organisations transitioning to a low carbon or to a, 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 a socially or environmentally better place. Um, it's not really rev relevant at the moment for the for the small businesses, but ESG frameworks are something that you should be looking at. And again, what we've tried to do is align the four pillars with the ESG criteria lists. And, you know, by doing that, you start to deliver a level of ESG compliance so that you're prepared um, in case, you know, there is a situation whether your organisation or other organisations with your supply chain need to go through ESG ratings agencies to satisfy the requirements of investment markets. And what we wanted to do is really kind of make a, a definition between, you know, CSR is something that builds a strong organisational culture. So that's a bottom up approach. It's about staff engagement, staff retention, attracting talent, tendering power building reputation and, and, and attracting and talking to customers. 
and it feeds into the ESG criteria, which is really about identifying and qualifying risks and opportunities, and talks predominantly to the board of directors, the company executives, the senior management, shareholders, and investors. But you'll notice at the bottom there that the same things feed into these areas. So stuff around working conditions, human rights, climate change, community engagement, zero waste to landfill, diversity and inclusion, all come up into a framework now we've got a, we've used our framework in this case of the four pillars, but there are other global frameworks like the GRI framework, which is a very good framework to look at as well. But then it's how you do two things really. It's it's build that social responsibility strategy within your business and within the supply chain in which you operate, and then how you can use that to address other areas like ESG or the SDGs or the sustainability frameworks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. The important thing really is, and I don't think I need to say this, but it is about return on investment. So we, we do think that this is about commercial viability. Um, it's really important that you take this seriously and build it as a business strategy because there is that return on social investment, which is, you know, and that really can be articulated in, you know, what's the cost of lower engagement? What's the cost of not um of, of, of high or low retention rather. What's the cost of not attracting the right talent or losing tenders? What's the cost of bad reputation? Um, you know, these will all have impacts on the future resilience of your business. And there's that social return on investment, which is the, 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 the doing good part, the impact, the positive impact that we're having um, by working collaboratively together and showing, recording, measuring and reporting on the, the improvements that we're making. So we are. So the future shape of business um, will be measured both in social and financial value. And in fact, there's um, a lot of work now really looking at that. You know, as well as that capital um, investment, that the 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 the, the, the kind of old-fashioned capitalism, I suppose, and it's all about making money and shareholder first idea. But I think the future shape of business is going to be looking as much at human capital and social capital as it does at financial capital. So it's important to really look at that return on social investment and that social return investment and report both of those things. So non-financial disclosure is something that will be required in the future along with your report and accounts. So the secret is planning a social responsibility as a business strategy. Using the four pillar framework as a starting point, we have the tools um, on our resources page that completely free to use um, that you can go to and you can download and you can use to start thinking about what your organization is doing and putting together the information that's required to deliver on all those commitments within those four pillars. And it may be that the larger the organization is identifying the right stakeholders within the business, like your head of HR, your head of finance, your head of facilities and so on and so forth, who will already have some of this data um, already and it's bringing that together so you can start to share it and communicate it and it's about delivering a csr policy um, so identifying your own key csr stakeholders so um, something that we're very keen to suggest that organizations do is create um, a small steering group or an individual or individuals within the company who become the csr enablers um, and who can actually deliver the capacity um, and the ability to pull together um, the work that's required to engage um, with the supply chain um, around what they're doing and pull together a, a picture of where you sit within that framework and, and where the gaps are on what you can be doing to take that forward. And ultimately, um, it's all about reputation, really. Um, so the thing is, is that, you know, it's about the reputation that your organization has for its internal audiences, its employees, but it's about the reputation that your business has um, in terms of a supply chain reputation, in terms of um, business reputation, consumer reputation, and so on and so forth. And I, I, I firmly believe that kind of modern branding, modern marketing is all around, you know, how you communicate and demonstrate your environmental and social responsibility. But the important thing is not to get involved with greenwashing or whitewashing. So it's about providing evidence that backs up your claims. The Green Claims Code that came into play this year will find organisations that are making claims about its environmental um, initiatives that it can't substantiate. And already the government has identified something like 40% of websites in the UK that are making claims that, that, that they can't be backed up. 
And again, we're seeing this um, in certain industry sectors, textiles being another one, a one I mentioned earlier, where they have a very bad record on this. So, you know, it's not about box ticking. It's not just about doing something and walking away from it. It's about making sure that you have a strategy that is delivered and that you can evidence and support. Um, otherwise, this is going to create a lot of damage. And I, I, I truly believe that within the ESG markets, um, when people stop trusting the data, then the whole thing collapses. And that's that's a really frightening thing to think about. So really, we've got to be in a position where the data that we provide is trustworthy and can be substantiated and backed up. Otherwise, that will have a huge negative impact on your reputation. So make sure you record and report all of your social responsibility successes. And if you're going to put future advisories in place, that makes you accountable. So you may think, well, we're not doing anything in those four pillars or we're doing very, very little. That doesn't really matter because this is about baselining what you're doing today so that you can record and report and measure it later. And if you've got things that you're not doing that you want to do, so in conversations with your supply chain about what they're doing that you would like to adopt, well then say that you're gonna do that, then you're accountable for it. Um, and then we can come back and look at you in a couple of years time and say, well, did you deliver? You know, you said you were going to do these things. Have you, have you achieved those things? So that's very important as well. And then show the impact that your CSR strategy and policy is making. So when you're working with that, C that supply chain CSR, you know, you can collaboratively work together to show the impact that you're making as a group of organizations. Um, and that can be used, as I say, to, to um, report your net zero commitments and so on and so forth. Um, finally, a plug for us. What we do is we independently recognize and validate. So, you know, you can become CSR accredited. Um, we have seen um, organizations that are accredited, certainly within the construction industry, who look for other organizations who are accredited because it aligns their thinking with, their, with, the, with the thinking of their organization. So we have seen um, organizations like Colas, for example, who's had a subsidiary accredited um, that has done so well in terms of communicating their social responsibility up and down the supply chain that, that all their other subsidiaries are now coming on board um, to be accredited at the moment. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a great um, end result. Do all of these things, present it to us, we'll accredit it, um, and then we can come and give you an annual health check to make sure that you're continuing on your journey. And it is about, if you're not already doing so, it is about starting a journey and planning for future success. So it's, you know, it is working in collaboration with your supply chain to do those things. It's not something we should do in isolation. And, you know, it's clear, um, these are recent statistics, but 91% um, of glo the global population want to see business do more than just make a profit. 92% want to buy a product that supports a cause. 72% of consumers believe that companies should have a legal responsibility to people and planet. And 64% of CES CEOs say that CSR programs are core to their business strategies. So th 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 we're seeing a, a momentum building around the importance of these issues and how they should be aligned um, with your with your your business strategies, your business vision and missions. So hopefully that leaves a little bit of time for some Q and A's. But uh, I hope that's given you an insight into you know, the driving forces behind building uh, a strong and powerful um, CSR supply chain. Thank you, Richard. That's been great. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for you and you've briefly touched upon some of the topics, but it's probably a good chance for us to elaborate on those a little bit more now. How does um, supply chain and corporate responsibility in the supply chain impact on tendering? So um, what we're finding in tendering, and we've got some great data on this, which we can share, is that in the UK specifically, and I'm sure it's the same around the world, but um, public sector tendering um, weights um, up to 30% of the points within a tender against um, environmental and social responsibility. So the public sector use the Social Value Act as a marker. So when you're either a construction company and you're tendering for a project, they'll be saying, okay, so how much of that project is going to use local recruitment? How are you gonna support local communities in that project? Um, and so on and so forth. And you have to be able to say, well, we've got policies in place that do that. A, a good example is a company that called the Stone Group, which are a huge IT company in the Midlands. Um, and we've done some community engagement work with them because all their work's around tendering. And um, what we've helped them do is address something that's aligned with their business. So they're in IT, 
So they've developed a community engagement program around digital poverty, and they are now working with universities and schools to refurbish and um, repurpose technology to give away free to parents of kid children who, who, where they can't afford that um, for their schoolwork. So sometimes you can align what your business is doing with a community engagement program. And of course, um, you know, the tendering um, really does focus on environmental as well. So it's about, you know, what is your company or organization doing to reduce its carbon footprint um, to, 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 again, to achieve things like net zero for that local authority. That's great. Thank you. Another question we have got is, um, what, what would be your advice if your, our supply chain does not respond to our requests? Well, that's a really very good question. And, and I think what we try and advocate is not hitting people with sticks. So it's it's all about the carrots in many cases, and it's about encouraging people. So, you know, not necessarily demanding that my supply chain does this, but but approaching them and saying, you know, we'd love you to be involved in something we're doing. We'd like your input and we'd, you know, like to bring you on the journey. And, you know, and if, if all of those things don't work, then, then, then you're, you know, you are left with a stark choice of, of saying, well, you know, we can't afford to work with you uh, in, in our supply chain anymore. We, we will have to find an alternative supplier to deliver that. So that's that's really very important as well, um, is, to, is to kind of, you know, there comes a point where the stick is useful, but ultimately it's, it's about a kind of gentle approach to work collaboratively together and, and to encourage people to work with you. Thank you, Richard. We do have a question um, from Liz. How exactly do you get CSR accredited and what are the steps and costs? Am I right in saying that we can send further information and put Liz directly in touch with you so you can give us give further information and support? Yeah, yeah, you can. And, and, I, and I think we can also say that Silverstone Technology Cluster are CSR accredited. And, you know, and, and what, what I, I have to emphasize is that as I've said with the, with, the, with the standard for social responsibility, is CSR should be for everybody, from the individual to multinationals. Um, it, it, it's not about an exclusive right for certain organisations. And our, we have an independent assessment panel of over 40 professionals. And what they keep telling us, oddly enough, the smaller the business, the bigger the impact, the bigger the environmental and social responsibility. And I think that's because sometimes bigger organisations are far more are far too rigid, whereas smaller businesses tend to be much more flexible and dynamic and tend to deliver more CSR per head than, than the bigger organisations do. So, so some people think, well, we're too small. No, no, it's about numbers. If I can get a million people to do a tiny thing, then we deliver huge impacts. And it's, that's, that's why working you know, within our supply chains is so important as well. Thank you, Richard. So to, to everyone who's joined the webinar, yes, we will be sending further information on how to get accredited and what the process is. At the STC, we received our silver CSR accreditation earlier in the year. So again, if anyone has any questions or wants to find out more, please feel free to reach out. Um, I think we've got time for one last question. Um, and it's to find out whether everything you've talked about, whether that's predominantly focused around UK requirements, or is this something that we need to consider at the global level and would affect companies outside the UK as well in the same way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, different countries will have slightly different nuances to the way they do things. But I think net zero is a, is a global commitment. And right at the outset of the presentation, I talked about kind of the global frameworks. Um, and I think you'll find that, you, you know, if you're importing and exporting from different countries, there are going to be increased requirements um, for you to look at your environmental and social responsibilities with regards to the companies you're working with. So, you know, there are things that are pertinent to this country. Um, uniquely, but there are going to be things that are relevant um, and, and common uh, across all geographies um, and all sizes of organisation as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think this will be the last question for today's session. Thank you very much. Your presentation has been very insightful and I'm sure a lot of attendees will have a lot of takeaways from today's um, session. I also wanted to thank all of you for joining us online. Um, it's before you log off, we are going to launch a quick poll. So we'd really welcome your feedback on that. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. Please feel free to check out our website um, to find out more about some of the last few events of the year we've got coming up. And of course, the annual conference that will be taking next uh, place next week. And we look forward to see you again. Have a lovely day. Thank you.